Did you know the best seeds for your garden don't come from the nursery? In fact, the seeds that will create the most robust and delicious fruits and vegetables come directly from your garden. This is because they are uniquely adapted to your growing conditions, better than anything you can buy from a fancy catalog or website. Through the magic of seed saving, it is quite possible to have the garden of your dreams. The best part is, saving your own seeds is surprisingly easy and fun. With a bit of instruction, anyone can become a seed saving superstar. Let us teach you how in our free seed saving webinar. Just text SEEDS to 33444 to sign up or visit SeedSavingHacked.org for more information. That's SEEDS to 33444 or visit SeedSavingHacked.org. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the grow your own food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Suzanne Bontempo of Plant Harmony to talk about her experience with gardening without pesticides. Suzanne has worked in the horticulture industry for over 20 years in a variety of capacities as a landscape contractor, a fine gardener leading garden maintenance teams, and in retail nursery management. Currently, she is an environmental educator and IPM advocate. Hmm, what's that? where she mentors and educates people. She does this by providing IPM trainings at hardware stores and garden centers, providing educational programs for garden clubs, businesses and organizations, and presenting lectures for the public through government agencies. Her message is focused around less toxic pest problem solving in the home and garden, pesticide reduction, and how to garden sustainably. She helps people see their home or garden as its own ecosystem and that the real solution to their problem usually doesn't require a pesticide at all. She enjoys raising the awareness of beneficial insects and how biological control methods in the garden are easy, effective, and fun. Suzanne was recognized for her excellence in her field, winning the 2013 IPM Innovators Award, and in 2016, received the San Francisco Green Business Award. Welcome to the show today, Suzanne. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Absolutely. You know, I'm really excited. We've not ever had somebody come onto the show to talk about IPM, and for our listeners out there that don't know what IPM is, well... We're going to tell you today. So, Suzanne, I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it all kind of started in the early 90s when I first started working with this one landscape contractor here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And I was in charge of running all the maintenance accounts, um, which were quite lovely. Many were even featured in like Sunset Magazine and such. However, I didn't realize the unique part of it was that we really, um, I was trained under her guidance and we as a team uh, really worked with a very holistic approach to gardens. We Mm -hmm. hardly used pesticides. With an occasional dormant spray of horticultural oil, it was um, really rare. We just were really heavy on all the organics and increasing the health of the soil and such. And then in the early 2000s, I kind of switched things up and found myself in working in retail nursery management, Mm -hmm. where I saw that people would come in with a pest problem, and I would try to guide them towards why they were having the problem with a solution for long-term, you know, um, problem solving or Mm -hmm. success. And they really didn't want to hear it. They're like, that's crazy. I want the quick fix. I want the spray. Just give me the chemical. That's yeah. fine. I don't need to do this. Mm-hmm. You know. And I really, I was blown away because it was just what I, you know, I just couldn't get over it that people were just yeah. so like, want this easy solution. 
which I didn't see as a solution at all. I saw it very destructive. So um, a destructive. Then, hold on here. A destructive solution. Yeah. Both. Yeah. 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 So then, you know, working in, you know, retail nursery management for, you know, fast forward to about uh, 2008 is when I was working with a really smart team of people, really great horticulturalists and here in the Bay Area. And I was really surprised that they also were very heavy handed with the chemicals, expecting it to be a little bit more of a progressive problem solving kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. But it sure wasn't. It was still, you know, yeah, we're all, you know, for the less toxic pesticides, but we're really still heavy with the synthetic fertilizers. So still another disconnect that I was a little bit kind of confused by. Right. Well, with all of that, I was able to kind of along my path, um, pick up classes here and there to kind of expand the work that I now currently do, which is the pretty much working solely as an environmental educator, talking to people on a daily basis around, you know, solving pest problems around the home and garden, you know, developing and, um, growing, you know, healthy, sustainable gardens without pesticides or working with businesses that do sell pesticides, how to guide their customers towards a less toxic approach and how less toxic pesticides work because Uh the um, expectation is going to be different than a traditional pesticide. So are pesticides really needed? I would like to say no. However, in some cases they are, you know, for instance, when something is out of balance and there is an extreme outbreak of a specific pest, you know, Mm -hmm. for instance, ants in the home, we might want to go for, Mm. you know, like a ant bait station, maybe some boric acid or something, and that will, you know, relieve the problem. Got it. Ultimately trying to find where they're coming in. But, you know, that's tricky with ants. They can find the smallest, tiniest spot. Right. Interesting you so, should use that that one because that's the one place on the urban farm in the past 28 years that I've actually <laughs> used a pesticide was a, with ant bait. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, sometimes we need them. And that's, yeah. it's not about, you know, and that's what integrated pest management is about. It's not about not using pesticides, but it's about using them only as a last resort. Yeah. So tell us, what is IPM? Oh, gosh. I wish there was a better terminology for it because I feel when I'm talking to the general public, oftentimes I see these glazed looks coming over people's yeah. eyes when I start mentioning integrated pest management. It doesn't sound very zhuzhy or glamorous. Yeah. But what it is, is I see IPM as a, um, well, it's the way we do problem solving around the home and garden, mm-hmm. right? Or pest problem solving. And I see it kind of as a matrix. It's really taking a minute to look at the system as a whole and identifying what the problem really is. Oftentimes we see the symptoms of the problem and we that that's where things get a little wonky, you know? So something could be chewing the leaves on your plant and uh-huh. you go out there and you see a ladybug larva and then you freak out and you know for sure it was that ladybug larva because you haven't properly identified the pest. Exactly. So you know, so that's really what it is, is understanding what really is going on. And then we adjust it and then we monitor it. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty simple. Yeah. But then we use a lot of different things. You know, it's like bolstering the health of the garden, working mm-hmm. with traps and barriers, inviting beneficial insects and, in, you know, different means to kind of let the system kind of take care of itself, you know, ultimately being fully sustainable and fully like holistic to be contained. Yeah. You know, people often ask me, you know, about what I use here on the urban farm. And I say, well, mostly I've spent the last 20 year, 28 years making the soil and the plants happy. And I found, yeah. I've found that when they're, you know, when I've got happy, healthy plants, are there bugs here? Yeah, I got bugs, but there's not a bug problem. Exactly. Exactly. It all starts 
with the soil and Mm -hmm. when we can, you know, build the health of the soil and just like load it up with all that beautiful microbiology Mm -hmm. and let those root root systems like thrive. And then we have these beautiful plants that can grow and then understanding how to water properly and inviting beneficials in. I, when I work with clients for the first time and they're like, you know, wanting to grow you know, they want to start a little raised bed vegetable garden. The first thing I do is bring in a bunch of flowering plants, insectary plants, plants that will attract the beneficials and Mm. the pollinators Mm -hmm. so that we can have, that's, that's the foundation of a vegetable garden. If you ask me and, you know, I'll always get a little bit of a raised eyebrow and then I have to explain, well, you know, we need to bring our, invite our friends in so they can take care of, you know, the, unfavorable bugs that we don't want in the garden or we don't want so many of yeah. you know we need to build that biodiversity up we want to you know create that habitat even though it could even just be on a little balcony or a porch but mm-hmm. we still need that cool so you've used uh, beneficials a couple of times let's kind of identify the what that is for our listeners Okay, super. So the beneficial insects that I talk about, I like to refer to them as the three Ps, the pollinators, the predators, and then the parasitics. So of course we know the pollinators. There we want to invite them in to increase the yields. Mm-hmm. You know, we know our butterflies and our bees and you know, even some moths and flies are pollinators. Mm-hmm. We want to invite them in so that we have nicer crops. Then we have our predators, which are going to be such as our ladybug, which actually feeds off of other insects. Mm. Um, But oftentimes, it's not the adult that is going to be the one with the voracious appetite. It's going to be actually the larva. So in the case of like the the lacewing Mm -hmm. or the ladybug, it's really the larva that is, you know, chowing down on all of those other soft-bodied insects. Yeah. So that's where, you know, every spring I'll get um, a customer if I'm working in a store that comes up with a Ziploc baggie full of ladybug larvae freaking out. Like, these are all over my garden. I need to kill them. And then I have to, you know, calm them down and show them, you know, what it is in the book because they won't believe me if I just say it. And then encourage them to get those ladybug larvae right back out there in the garden. Yeah. And then the parasitics, which is probably one of my favorite categories because it seems really gruesome and weird. <laughs> right. um, although, yeah, uh, this is where they got the idea for that movie Aliens with Sigourney Weaver. Mm-hmm. But it's, uh, you know, for instance, parasitic uh, wasps or flies, they'll lay their egg oftentimes on the insect. When that egg hatches, that larva will then burrow inside and devour the bad insect and then emerge as the adult. Probably the most common is going to be um, one of the parasitic wasps that lays its eggs on like tomato hornworms. Although I'm a big fan of the tomato hornworm because it will um, develop into an important pollinator. Oh, yeah. But we don't like the fact that a tomato hornworm can take down an entire six foot tomato in one day. Right, get, exactly. I, I, yeah, I understand that. But usually, if I see them in a garden, I'll try to encourage someone to uh, maybe bring it to, if they have a child, bring it to this elementary school um, in a terrarium to watch it go through mm, its life cycle. Right. Right. Excellent. So you, you've also in the past 10 minutes identified a couple of things that I get a lot of questions about. Somebody brings something to me or they send me a picture and it's, oh my gosh, I've got to kill this without having <laughs> yeah. identified. You probably get that a lot, don't you? Yeah, yeah, we, we're we afraid, you know, we're kind of a fear-based, uh, that's what humans are, right? It's kind of in our nature. Uh-huh. So if we don't know what it is, we don't want it. Right. We, we want it to get, to be away from us. Yeah. So that's why it's really, really, really important to identify what you're looking at before you decide to take action. Because it, if it is a, a non-beneficial pest in your garden, there's so many different ways to to address it, that addressing it one way with a spray on neem oil, per se, might not even touch it. Is that not the case? 
Well, correct. I mean, gosh, do you guys, are you familiar with like giant white fly? Is that an insect that's in your area? No, and thank God, I think. Yeah, it's in the Southern California area. It's very, uh, in more tropical, warmer areas. And it actually creates a strange webbing underneath the leaves. They love the uh, hibiscus. And so very common on the hibiscus um, leaves, you'll see this weird, it's almost like cotton candy, you know, webbing. Oh, wow. And people think it's a fungus. And so a lot of times they'll come in asking for a fun side. Yeah, asking, you know, and you'll ask a few more questions. And what you find out is that it's actually the giant white fly. And mm-hmm. the fungicide is not going to do anything. Right. So it kind of goes back to really understanding what it is, proper identification. And do you need to actually take action? You know, we have here in California, there's a little spittle bug that comes around it's yep. like a um okay uh it creates all that little spittle spittle yeah it looks of, like spit on a like a rosemary yeah, right people freak out a little yeah. bit they're like oh my gosh but that insect is really has such a short amount of time that it's actually causing um any type of aesthetic you know distress it's really no problem with the plant it's so mild but it really aesthetically bothers us so sometimes people get real really alarmed they want to go get some product to spray on it by the time they get back it's pretty much you know after that week or two that pest is usually already gone yeah so also understanding its life cycle and what's it doing in the garden at that moment yeah exactly so in our pre-conversation Suzanne uh, you asked me a question that actually made me a little bit uncomfortable and I I haven't figured that out yet (laughs) Uh, but you asked me what pests I deal with here on the urban farm. And like I said earlier, I've done so much work to create such a healthy, organic environment here. I really don't have a pest problem. And then I thought about it. And it's one that I haven't been able to fix yet. And we were talking about the giant white flies a minute ago. These are small white flies. And what they do is they come in on our grapevines and in the spring. So before it gets super hot. And it pretty much annihilates the grapes. And I haven't, wow. qu- I haven't quite figured out what to do with them yet. Yeah. So that one, it seems to me that it's um, temperature driven, right? It's starting to get really uh, warm yep. and those white flies are coming in. They feel really protected and it's just kind of ideal environment for them. Mm-hmm. So I, one of my kind of go-tos when I have a plant that's under like distress is I like to do a foyer spray of the um, sea kelp, like a liquid mm-hmm. seaweed. And... Well, but you've mentioned you're a fan of foyer, foliar sprays. I am. Yeah. Have you worked with sea kelp before? I have. And yeah. I know that it's beneficial, but I think yeah. you can tell us why. Yeah. Well, uh, sea kelp's pretty awesome. It's actually, the sea kelp is actually a cell growth stimulator. Uh-huh. It really bolsters the cells of the plant. And so if there is some type of a fungal problem or it's been hit with um, uh, insect problem, it will kind of help uh, increase those cells uh, in that area, mm-hmm. which I'm a huge fan of. It's also easy. Uh, sea kelp is pretty readily available to find. I mean, I would say um, working with a really good quality compost tea would also mm. be a go-to. Mm-hmm. But finding a good quality compost tea is not always easy. You have to make um, it yourself. So, yeah, it's challenging and it, it takes a lot of work and you really want to make sure you've got your you know, microbiology numbers up and nice and balanced and healthy and great. So it's a little challenging for some folks. So I, that's where I will always kind of go to the sea kelp, sea kelp as yes. my, as a second. So when you say foliar spray, what does that mean and how do we apply it? Okay, good question. Well, it's actually going to go into either uh, your, you know, backpack sprayer. So, Mm -hmm. you know, those are traditionally used for pesticides, but I use mine for fertilizers or like a hose end sprayer that you can attach to the hose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll read the directions on what the application rate is and you'll either dial it up to the two tablespoons per gallon or four tablespoons per gallon or whatever that Mm -hmm. application rate is going to be. And then you're just going to essentially, you know, hose down your plants. A couple things, though, you want to keep in mind is that we always want to do this during the cool part of the day. Mm. And ideally, if there is some shade in the area, so maybe 
uh, like after the sun has gone down, mm -hmm. just because plants are going to be sometimes a little bit stressed if there is too much on their leaves, they can't really what, transpire with trans. Yep. I have a hard time with that yeah, word. Yeah, I know. Uh, That's okay. So you know, okay. So uh, they can't. They won't really be able to do that readily enough. Um, the other thing is making sure your plants are well hydrated because you will be you know, essentially suffocating their cells for a mm. minute until it can evaporate off or absorb in. Yeah. So those are just some tricks I've learned from, uh, nice. you know, accidentally killing plants. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so that once you, you know, have that kind of dialed in, it's, you'll see your plants almost like go from like kind of weak and struggling to like light and fluffy Epic. and happy yeah. and perky. And it's pretty cool. Yeah. I have to tell you, I'm, I'm sitting over here smiling because I got an email from a guy this week. Uh, who planted some plants in his yard and he used a foliar spray on them and it negatively impacted them. So now oh. I have questions to ask him to see what happened. So yeah. thanks. Yeah. I did that for in a client's backyard for a Daphne that was pretty sizable. Uh -huh. um, Daphne's are so fussy and I didn't realize how fussy they were until I did that and I killed their plant mm. and I, thus I had to replace this, you know, $200 Daphne, it was, yeah, ever since then, I'm like, okay, there, you know, only when we really need it. Right. Right. And be, and very, you know, right time of day and very conscious about it. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So you also mentioned compost tea. Tell everybody what that is. Cause it's really important. Okay, super. Well, I only know a couple companies that actually manufacture mm -hmm. or create the compost tea, and it's all under the guidance of Dr. Ingham's Soil Food Web, mm -hmm. where they have their equipment, and it's a tea made with, I guess, the directly from the compost, yeah. but it's the extraction from the compost, yep. but it's agitated, and it's... And it's fed? It's fed and yep. it's aged, you know, so that they could, the microbiology can um, reproduce and those numbers can get really, you know, high. And then you can spray it on the plants mm -hmm. um, or the ground or, you know, your whole garden. It's a really great way to inoculate your garden with some instant microbiology. It's different from I, sometimes people think that like the the moisture that comes out of a worm bin mm -hmm. is compost tea. And that isn't exactly the same thing. So there is, it is very specific and yeah. having good quality live microbiology in the compost tea is, is really important. Yeah. Yeah. And the stuff coming out of the end of your worm bin is, although it's not compost tea, you definitely want to use it on your garden. Oh yeah. Get it out there. You know, that's definitely going to be loaded with a lot of good stuff, but it's, it's just sometimes people, you know, just get that mixed up a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So the myths around organics, that they're not effective, uh, can you speak to that? Oh, yeah. I get folks in the aisles all the time wanting something really strong to kill whatever bug or mm -hmm. whatever problem they have. And people really are of this mindset that they think organic pesticides are not that strong, not that effective. And this is a challenge for me to have, you know, only really a couple minutes with someone in an mm, aisle to talk right. about, um, you know, well, yeah, actually, these are all pesticides that are designed to kill something and they, you know, really do work, you know, they are very effective. Mm -hmm. And one of the strongest pesticides that I see on the market is, you know, comes from the chrysanthemum flower, the um um, the pyrethrin, which is an instant kill. Mm -hmm. It um, doesn't have any UV tolerance, so it starts to break down really within hours. So it has oh, little to, to no impact. Yeah, little to no impact on the environment. However, it's broad spectrum and it will kill anything that it is in contact with. Yeah. And we also should be wearing safety gear. Um, I even know there was this one manager of a store down in the South Bay. He told me he was spraying neem and he had a dermal reaction. So, mm. you know, we, the, again, these are pesticides designed to kill something and we right. really should be <laughs> wearing long sleeves and non cotton gloves and not spraying on it, you know, a, a day where there's a little breeze because we don't know how we're going to, you know, respond to the pesticides either. Right. Right. Exactly. And you also mentioned neem. So yes. 
Let's talk about Neem because it's it could be good and it could be maybe not so good, right? Well, Neem, yeah, you're right. Um, Neem is a wonderful pesticide that's actually been used for over 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it comes from the Neem tree that's native to India and Pakistan, and it's the extracts of the uh, oils from the nut of that tree. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's a very broad spectrum pesticide. It also is considered or referred to as a three in one, that it is that which means it's an insecticide, a miticide, and a fungicide. Oh. So it's kind of cool. It does a lot of things, you know, it can um, take you know it can um, you know handle your powdery mildew or your black spot or rust mm -hmm. on your roses. It'll manage mite problems that might get on your tomato plants. And it also uh, you know, control a number of insects. However, the thing is with the neem oil, because it's broad spectrum, it doesn't, you know, if there's beneficial insects present, um, they're also going to be, you know, taken out by this pesticide as well. Wow. They'll also be affected by it. And that's what the broad spectrum term means, right? Yes. Yes. So for instance, um, many people know about insecticidal soap. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very narrow spectrum um, pesticide, which really only its targets is soft bodied insects like aphids, white fly nymphs, um, mealy bugs, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And it essentially like melts their exoskeleton. Right. But it's it's not going to affect anything beyond that. So like if a ladybug beetle was present, it wouldn't, you know, um, have that much an effect on the beetle because of its hard shell. Mm -hmm. But then broad spectrum pesticides, you know, like the pyrethrins and the neem will actually, you know, take out a number of insects. Yeah. It's not so, you know, selective. Got it. So let's also touch on BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. What can you tell oh, us yeah. about that? Actually, I am a big fan because it is so narrow spectrum. Mm -hmm. It only, um, it's a natural bacteria. Mm -hmm. It's a beneficial bacteria that we um, see in the industry, which is wonderful. And it is a uh, pesticide that needs to be ingested. So this is not a contact kill like the other ones that we've been mentioning. This is actually something that has to, like the caterpillar itself, mm -hmm. which the caterpillar is the target, it needs to ingest it. So we'll spray um, some plants that have uh, maybe an undesirable caterpillar that's mm -hmm. chewing the leaves. Let's go back to that tomato hornworm maybe. Yeah. We could spray our tomato, the tomato hornworm ingests it, and um, this bacteria actually destroys the gut of the caterpillar. The thing is, is that um, it is really important that uh, we do have the pest present because a lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, is that we'll see chewing on the leaves mm -hmm. and we'll jump to some conclusions. And if there is no pest present, then there is no pest to ingest the pesticide. So then mm -hmm. it doesn't, you know, it's a little bit of a waste of time and money to spray a pesticide when there's no nope. um, critter there to take care of it. Yeah. So what I hear you say, so this is for caterpillars only. Correct. And you really need to make sure that they're present there for it to work. Correct. Excellent. Be yes, yes. So one of the other pests that happens here, and I have these under control for the most part, is the skeletonizers on grapes. Wow. Okay, so that's a pest I'm not as familiar with. Ah. But um, what, what is it like a um, psyllid? It, it is it is a caterpillar. Okay. And it turns into this little silver-winged moth thing. And mostly the way I control it on the grapevines here is that when they first lay their eggs, they lay the eggs all in one place and they'll lay, you know, 100 eggs. So all of a sudden you have 100 of these guys climbing on your grapevine, but they start on one leaf. Wow. And then as they grow, they go to other leaves. So one of the big ways that I manage the this particular pest is I watch for them. And if they show up on my grapes, I just take that, when they're young, I just take the leaf off of the grapevine and I toss it to the chickens. And, Brilliant. you know, and problem solved. Right. So that's a great, 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 great example of IPM at its finest, mm -hmm. where you're monitoring 
you've been with your garden long enough that you kind of have a sense of when uh, this insect might be around. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes when we're not so familiar with that, we, um, I try to guide folks towards working with some type of a sticky trap as a monitoring oh, device. Right. Uh -huh. uh, not a pheromone trap, but a sticky trap. Uh, because that helps people that maybe aren't so like dialed into their garden or mm -hmm. don't have the luxury of being in their garden every day. Mm -hmm. And then to when there is presence of this insect, then to take action. And your action is perfect that you can destroy the eggs before they hatch. Yeah. Or right after they hatch. Yes. Yeah. So that's awesome. A lot of times when it is a moth that is, you know, when we see the moths present, we mm -hmm. know that the moth is going to have, yeah. you know, a larva and the mm -hmm. larva is usually the one doing the damage is yep. how can we, you know, uh, break that life cycle right. um, and, you know, manage it that way. So, and you've certainly done it. So well done. Awesome. Oh, thank you. I'm patting. I, <laughs> I got a great big smile on my face, James, don't I? And, uh, and I'm patting myself on the back. Yay. <laughs> yeah. That's a tough one. I mean, yeah. some pests are not easy, so it's really mm -hmm. all about kind of, uh, you know, staying ahead of the game a little bit and then understanding what what's your threshold. So having a yeah. few of the leaves chewed, maybe that's okay. But you know, I always say like less than 5%. Mm -hmm. Are we at 10% of damage on the plant? And that still might be okay in some cases. But when we start to get like 30% damage, mm -hmm. action needs to be taken. There is something that's right. out of balance. Or, or you wake up and your entire tomato plant has been eaten by one uh, tomato hormone. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. It's pretty devastating. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. I understand yeah. completely. Exactly. Wow. This is some great information. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's fun. I get pretty pumped helping. I mean, I'm not really a fan about, you know, talking about uh, pesticides, uh, like I said before. And uh, personally, I try to be 100% pesticide free at yep. this one um, small farm there large garden, yeah, small farm that I have that I've been growing now at for um, a little over a year. Nice. But it's fun to help people. I really love helping people and helping them solve their problems, mm -hmm. you know? Nice. Nice. So did you, have you named your farm yet? Uh, yeah. It's a property that um, I get to help manage with my boyfriend. So I'm out there uh -huh. a couple days a week and... I was able to um, get it to a place where we were getting a lot of vegetables going and we were able to share the abundance. Nice. And there's a small orchard on there that we have to Ooh. manage and take care of. And there's grapes and such. However, my goal is really to be 100% pesticide free so that I can really talk to people about, yeah. yeah, when those critters come in, how am I handling it? You know, yeah. it's like there's, yeah, there's a there's, solution to every answer. And yeah. in my, my book, it doesn't include pesticides. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Oh, dear. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, gosh, there's a lot of failures, right? And that's really how we learn. I mean, you really can't learn until you've pushed some limits so far that mm -hmm. you've um, actually failed. Um, intentionally or by mistake, but yeah. um, this is something I really have to say that um, is is part of you know the cycle of all all things of life. But right now, um, at this very moment, I would have to say that I have a problem saying uh, no. Mm. And this time of year, I'm I'm pretty packed. My schedule is uh -huh. really at maximum capacity. Yeah. But I just like helping people so much. I want, you know, I get emails, I get calls. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I just, I, I have to say no, because when I don't say no, mm -hmm. then I'm not able to be of service to the, at the capacity that I like to be of service. Yeah. And then I'm really disappointed. And so I've learned because of so many personal disappointments of not giving people my 110% right. that I have to say no. And that's a really, really, really hard thing for me. So it's kind of, that's my um, failure and, and process learning curve yeah. that I'm working on yeah. right now. That's a really big one because we, when we don't say no, when we need to, then we're not taking care of ourselves. 
Yeah. We're not taking care of ourselves or my own little garden that right. I like to take care of. Yeah. So, um, cause that needs time too. Right. Because yeah. So yeah. When I laughed a minute ago, it was a laugh of recognition because you, you, you know, you're pretty visual there. I'm pretty visual, visible, I guess that's a better word, visible here in Phoenix. And I get emails every day from people that need something, want something. Oh my gosh, I want to start a community garden. Where do I start? And it's just like, I I need to clone me three or four times in order to get it all done. Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's in, I mean, I love it. I'm so grateful and I'm so, so, so grateful for the abundance of work that has come my way Mm -hmm. Um, and all the beautiful, wonderful people that I get to be in touch with and help. But it's really hard to say no. Yeah. 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 And we learn it and we learn it and we learn it. Yes. I'm doing a little learn it dance right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what do you consider your biggest success? Oh gosh. Okay. So my bi- biggest success I would say right now is the, you know, the small farm that um, I've developed at this property. I get to manage part-time with my boyfriend. Well, he's there full-time and I'm just out there part-time, but there's an orchard. Um, it's about two acres, but I've taken about a third of an acre and I've really developed it um, for uh, doing uh, food production. Mm-hmm. And in heck, gosh, the first uh, six months, there was more food than we knew what to do with. So yeah, talk nice. about a learning curve. Yeah, It's like, yeah, all those vegetables do grow. And then, yikes, you got to harvest them. And then you got to process them and do something <laughs> with them, you know? Uh-huh. So uh, it was, that was really fun. But it was a really great opportunity to get more food um, out into the community and out to local restaurants. Yeah. And, you know, just to learn what really is possible yeah. What is really possible? And uh, heck, man, Mother Nature is pretty brilliant. And if you just get out of her mm-hmm. way a little bit, man, she gives you a lot in return. Yeah. There's a couple of things I tell people all the time because I've been, I've been growing food for over 40 years. And one of them is that nature is so incredibly abundant. And yeah. in all of the planet, there's only one place that this whole notion of lack lives and it's between our ears. Yeah, you're right about that. Because you know, when I go to my garden, it's like, you know, an apple tree in my front yard or a peach tree in my front yard. It's like giving me so many peaches. What do I do with them all? Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's true. I mean, I guess, I mean, I've being a San Francisco Bay Area native and living in the city for decades, I've never had ground to plant into, mm, but I mm-hmm. always worked as a professional gardener and had other people's ground to plant into. Mm-hmm. So when I actually had this opportunity to like, plant into earth, uh, you know, and I'm a big fan of seeds and starting everything from seed and, you know, developing that way. Oh my gosh. Well, when those seeds actually grow into full size plants, you're like, wow, we, and yeah, it's no joke. Tomatoes, zucchinis, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, sky's the limit. It is, it just starts coming. Yeah. And you're, you gotta be ready. (laughs) Exactly. And that goes into (laughs) the other thing that I tell people about farming. And that is that, Growing food is only 50% of the game. Absolutely. Man, I've come, I, I mean, I'm, yeah, preserving and dehydrating yep. and juicing Packaging and, and you, marketing. Yeah. Yeah. You name it. It's like, wow, full, that's another full time job on top of <laughs> right, exactly. full time job. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Cool. So, what drives you? Gosh, man, every day people, you know, just, when I go into, you know, like, um, one of the stores, one of the retailers that I, uh, work with and get hugs from the associates Mm -hmm. because we've developed this great relationship and they know I'm there to support them. I'm there to help them understand, you know, whatever the pest problems are, whatever the new pesticide is that came in so that they can do their job better, Mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, when I'm talking to a customer in an aisle and, I see them like really get what I'm saying and they're so grateful Uh that I've, you know, brought something to their attention that, you know, maybe don't use this one pesticide if you have your little dog present or if there's a child or, you know, like they never considered, you know, oftentimes Mm -hmm. we're coming in, we've got like tunnel vision, like we want to get rid of this pest. Right. But, you know, sometimes the solution is really simple and it doesn't need to be this big, you know, chemical spray. Right. And, and yes. for people listening out there, one of the things that's really, really important is if you're using chemicals in your backyard and you have pets, 
chickens, cats, dogs, and small children. If they're out playing in it, they're getting in it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's, you know, or when I'm giving a talk, you know, presenting a program to, you know, a group of people, it's seeing their eyes kind of like seeing the light bulb kind mm-hmm. of go off in their head where they really got it, you know, and I, I just am so pumped, you know, to be able to share. I mean, I'm not talking about anything that's like, you know, new systems or new strategies or anything that's like cutting edge. This is just basic gardening. This is the right. way our ancestors gardened before, yeah. you know, pesticides were on the market. So it's just reminding them and actually um, <laughs> helping them, giving them support and giving them permission to actually do something a little different than they considered. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. It's super great. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it lights, it lights us up. That's why we do what we do, right? Yeah. 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 I can't imagine doing anything else, you know? Amen just, to that. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. So I'm all about education and I have to know, is there a book that's been influential for you in this process in your life? Wow. Yeah. There are so many wonderful books, but I have to say, well, right now I'm in the middle of the hidden life of trees. Oh, uh, are you familiar with that one? I'm not. It's- Oh, it's killer. It's really killer. It's by Peter, um, and I'll probably get his last name incorrect, Wollenben, W-O-H-L-L-E-B-E-N. It's really mind-bending how beautiful the community of trees are Mm. and really what's going on in the soil and in the forest and in our own backyard. So highly recommend that one. And then did you, have you heard of this book by um, Matthew Silverton, Blinded by Science? He's a British um, man. He talks about the vibrational levels of plants, of really all things, and how that has a big role in like biodynamic farming and things like that. It's also one of those mind bending, like Mm -hmm. really, I just can't, can't get enough. Yeah. But my very first um, book that kind of was one of those where I was like, whoa, was by Robert Corrick, Roots Demystified. Oh, yes. When he really goes into the root systems and what we don't see. And I, I realized that so many people don't understand what's going on under, under underground. The and yeah. yeah, and that's why there are so many um, maybe uh, struggles or challenges they're having above ground because they're not really addressing what's going on in the soil and, and helping the root systems thrive. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Wow. I would say is to be patient, to Mm. really be patient and to see, maybe take a couple more moments to really look and observe what's going on. And Sometimes what we'll see, like I'll go back to the chewing marks on the leaf. Mm-hmm. We are we can be very reactive, and depending on what else is going on in our lives, maybe sometimes overreactive. Mm-hmm. You know, we are very sentimental when it comes to our plants, and we get very protective over them, and we take things very personally when a plant isn't doing very well. So um, what I like to share is just. Uh, I like people just to be a little bit more patient Mm. and to um, just kind of observe and just take note, notice what's going on. And oftentimes the answer comes to you. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Suzanne. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Greg, so much. It's really been fun. I Uh, really appreciate it. You bet. Oh my gosh. I've been smiling the whole time. Love this conversation. (laughs) Right on. So how can our listeners find you? Well, I am um, currently working on getting my website to actually be a little bit more informative where Mm -hmm. um, when I, you know, my events will be on there and such, and that's going to be um, plantharmony.org. Perfect. And you can also reach out to me, Suzanne Bontempo at gmail.com. Since my Plant Harmony um, email is not quite up yet, um, that's in transition And those would be the best ways. Perfect. 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 Well, you can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash IPM. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Did you know the best seeds for your garden don't come from the nursery? 
In fact, the seeds that will create the most robust and delicious fruits and vegetables come directly from your garden. This is because they are uniquely adapted to your growing conditions, better than anything you can buy from a fancy catalog or website. Through the magic of seed saving, it is quite possible to have the garden of your dreams. The best part is, saving your own seeds is surprisingly easy and fun. With a bit of instruction, anyone can become a seed saving superstar. Let us teach you how in our free seed saving webinar. Just text SEEDS to 33444 to sign up or visit SeedSavingHacked.org for more information. That's SEEDS to 33444 or visit SeedSavingHacked.org. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.